William Eggington is the director of the Alexander Grass Humanities Institute at Johns Hopkins University. He is a prolific author and translator with such works as How the, World's, How the World Became a Stage, The Philosopher's Desire, and The Man Who Invented Fiction. He also contributes to The Stone, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and Stanford University's Arcade. In this trenchant analysis, William Eggington argues that our current national crisis is the result of personal identity ideals overwhelming our sense of community. This imbalance is especially pronounced on college campuses, where identity politics is the norm. Along with, the turning in, along with turning institutions of higher learning into exclusive, expensive clubs for the cultural and economic elite, this focus on individualism is leading to a new kind of intolerance, degrading civic discourse, and distracting progressive politics from its commitment to equality. This book challenges us to re-engage with our history and to imagine our nation in new, more inclusive ways. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Wow. Good evening. It's great to be at Politics and Prose. So, as Aaron said, I'm going to read for a little while. Um, it's a... Uh, it's a complicated book in the sense that I've got three sections that, uh, that work together as one, identity, inequality, and community. And so what I've tried to do is, is grab a, a little chunk from each, about maybe eight to ten minutes, uh, I'm guessing, of, of reading, and then I'll just settle down and take your questions. So, uh, so without further ado, let me begin. This chapter is called Undoing History. In the fall of 2016, George Washington University's history department dropped the requirement of American history from its major. <laughs> the dean of GWU's Columbian College of Arts and Sciences, Ben Vinson, is an expert on Mexican history as well as African American history. He told me that the department, which had made the decision before he came on board as dean, was conflicted about it, as he was, but felt that the change reflected the evolving role of the field of history in an increasing increasingly globalized world. It was also about choice and accommodating student preference, he added, as well as letting them go, quote, deeper into the curriculum. Katrin Schulteis, the chair of the history department, concurred. She said, the main gain for students is that they have a great deal more flexibility than they had before, and they can adapt it to whatever their plans are for the future. Whatever they want to do, there's a way to make the history department work for them, end quote. While the irony of dropping American history as a requirement for the major in history is particularly trenchant in the school named after our first president, <laughs> GWU is not alone. In fact, further than a third, fewer than a third of the nation's top history programs currently require students majoring in history to study any American history. Obvious questions of intellectual responsibility aside, one of the problems with decisions like this is how they play into a narrative spun by AM talk radio personalities that pits professors and a global economic elite against a core set of American values. In a statement put out in 2016, ACTA, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, a conservative watchdog group that describes itself as, quote, committed to academic freedom, excellence, and accountability at America's colleges and universities, complained, quote, Many of the same institutions that do not require history majors to take a course on United States history do specify that they must complete coursework in areas outside the United States. And many allow some very strange, highly specialized topics to substitute for a course on the United States. History majors at Williams, could, Williams College could choose, quote, soccer and history in Latin America, making the beautiful game. End quote. At Swarthmore, one choice could be, quote, modern addiction, cigarette smoking in the 20th century. At Bowdoin, it might be Lawn Boy Meets Valley Girl. I should say I have not verified that that is an actual course. As is often the case with politicized decisions in academia, the facts of the GWU decision have been exaggerated in the press and in reactions, such as that of ACTA. The American history requirement at GWU was not a single course. It was a sequence of courses. Moreover, the strength and depth of the faculty in American history, the same faculty that came to the unanimous decision to remove the sequence as a requirement, make it highly improbable that a student can major in history without taking at least a course, if not more than one, in American history. But is, as is often the case, controversies like this one 
are less about the facts than about the underlying narrative. Battles around curriculum in the United States colleges, in US colleges and universities, are expressing a deep cultural divide between two opposing ideas of community based on two different understandings of human nature. One view holds that community's purpose is essentially paternalistic, that institutions exist to correct our selfish and rebellious impulses. The other view is that humans are essentially good and that original goodness must be salvaged from the corruption brought about by communal institutions. In the former view, when universities change their curricula to meet student demands, they are betraying their purpose at, as representative institutions of the larger community. In the latter view, over time, institutions like universities, churches, and governments become the sedimented repositories of society's worst prejudices and, in and, in and iniquities, and thus reforming a canon, like modernizing a religion, is necessary to shake free of tradition's limiting constraints on humanity's natural virtue. What ACTA's statement and such popular ridicule of academic specialization overlooks is the profound progress in knowledge that has in fact accompanied the diversification of canons and the emergence of new fields of specialization. Like the growth of the specter of political correctness, these caricatures stem at least in part from a failure to understand new methods and new interpretations in their proper context and history. Behind, beyond every or behind every enthusiastic but perhaps shallow graduate term paper about, quote, queering the canon, there is an extraordinary scholarship of a professor like Stephen Orgel, whose research into the young men who played women's roles on the Elizabethan stage shed new light on our understanding of how gender roles and prejudices change over time. Orgel, a legendary professor of English with whom I studied when I was a graduate student at Stanford, is the author of Impersonations, the Performance of Gender in Shakespeare's England. He was also openly gay well before it was widely accepted to be so. In his preface to that pathbreaking book, he recounts a phone conversation with a teacher from his own school schoolboy days, in which the teacher had objected to boys playing the female roles in school productions because it was, quote, turning the boys into pansies. Orgel's research into the staging practice of theater companies in Elizabethan England provided him and his readers in the 1990s with powerful evidence that, as he writes, everything we were taught in biology and sex education classes, to the contrary, notwithstanding, gender was obviously not a fixed category, end quote. Given our understanding of sexuality today and the broad support that gays and lesbians have won over the past 20 years and transgender, pe transgender people are finally winning today, this English professor's research was as prescient as it was historically accurate. Until the 1960s, most colleges, especially the elite ones, were overwhelming, overwhelmingly male and white. In the late 1960s and the 1970s, the number of black students attending such schools started slowly increasing, even, in, even as they remained significantly underrepresented. At the same time, some schools were opening their doors to women for the first time, allowing for an influx that eventually led to women outnumbering men in higher education. As they arrived on campuses where their race or sex put them in a distinct minority, blacks and women could often find strength and communal support in student groups or with specific professors. Starting in the 1970s, they could also enroll in newly crafted majors intended to study the historical experiences of racial minorities and women in the United States. This same process was repeated about a decade later by gays and lesbians as they laid claim to their long neglected civil rights, started coming out in larger numbers and established departments and programs of queer studies on campuses around the country. In each case, exposure to others who had shared their experiences in an environment that still resembled the white male world of their parents' generation gave these students a platform and an intellectual justification for insisting that their points of view be recognized and valued. At the same time, though, these students were being taught that their experience was incomprehensible to those who hadn't shared it with them, a position that implicitly justified excluding white, straight, or male students from their groups. This engendered a paradox of sorts. By claiming the recognition and equality that was rightly theirs to claim and promoting the specificity of their perspectives, which had not been adequately accounted for by either uh, for either in the popular imagination or in college curricula, ethnic and gender studies programs and the professors and students who gravitated toward them were also perceived as undermining the very spirit of, commu of community that had made their emergence possible in the first place. As academic disciplines that focused on underrepresented groups, experiences, 
uh, achieve their goals of raising awareness about these groups' experiences and laying legitimate claim to equality, they also rightly drew attention to how the larger community has been and continues to be complicit in the oppression and disenfranchisement of these groups. The whites and men who had most benefited from strong federal investments in the national community felt personally attacked and in some cases responded by, bel by belittling the new academic fields and thus intensifying those students' feelings of marginalization. What was lost in the mix was a philosophical commitment to the idea of community itself and to the tradition of thinkers that, made it, that had made it central to the American project. Respect for minorities and women's rights to equal representation and, and respect sorry, respect for minorities and women's rights to equal representation and respect is the inevitable outcome of, the, of America's idea of community. But as groups have gained in confidence and risen to claim that recognition, the nation's real community, that emotional glue that holds it together, hasn't evolved at the same pace. It's as if we started down a road towards an important goal, but got stuck in the mud halfway there. Now the challenge is to imagine that community anew, in a way that includes the multitude of new perspectives that have made their claim to be part of the American project. The first step is to understand how we got to this point, where the necessary inclusion of a broader span of individual experiences has been won at the expense of a more expansive model of community. As a result of the diversification of education brought on by the civil rights era, new fields of study and new approaches exploded into the academy in the 1970s and 80s, giving more people a place at the table and opening the doors to fresh insights and knowledge. This was positive not only for the humanities, but also for the students who seeing themselves in some of the new perspectives that were being explored were inspired to become teachers and researchers themselves. This was a period of extraordinary democratization in higher education, and it should be recognized and celebrated for that. George Washington University's Ben Vinson and I were students together at Dartmouth College in the 1980s. Like I do, he remembers the foment of those times and believe that it was, believes that it was at least in part due to the intellectual revolution we lived through that a young black man like himself could go on to be a professor of history and eventually a dean at GWU. When he and his colleagues decided to make the study of U.S. history optional for the major, they were doing so in this very spirit of expansiveness. They were recognizing that other parts of the world, the experiences of other nations, also deserve a place at the table. At the same time, Ben admitted to me that he understood how this very revolution would feed a growing narrative in which the humanities professors of the academic left have abandoned a core set of values and stories that are essential to maintaining our broader sense of community. He conceded, that while the new ways of reading texts and understanding our common past that opened our eyes when we were college students constituted a vital corrective to the naive, to the naive universalistic assumptions that preceded it, they also had the effect of undermining the idea that America shares a set of common stories and values. To the extent that these stories excluded huge portions of the population, it was necessary to undermine them but it, was also, it is also necessary to understand that those exclusions were themselves a violation of America's promise. Going forward, it will be the task of the humanities not only to deconstruct, but also to rebuild, not only to undermine, but to imagine anew. As Harvard president, then Harvard president, Drew Gilpin Faust would have it, this is the ultimate job of the humanities, to help, quote, Americans explore and better understand how we came to be the nation people and world we are, to reflect on our identities as citizens and human beings, to ask profound questions about origins, legacies, and meaning, to contemplate where we are going as individuals, as a society, and why. This chapter is called The Liberal Imagination. While they were busily at work consolidating a canon of great works of literature and thought, Mid-century critics like T.S. Eliot didn't think that their principal criterion in selecting authors was their gender or the color of their skin, even if, de facto, their canon was entirely white and almost entirely male. Rather, the critics who patrolled the canon's borders were enamored of an idea of what made a work great. That idea is worth paying attention to, because as it turns out, it is the kind of idea that is both essential for a democratic community to function and instrumental in opening such communities to embrace new identities. In an important essay called The Function of Criticism, 
Eliot remarked that the reason a scholar had to read literature and discuss it with others, that is, the essence of what takes place in a humanities seminar, was to discover and explore differences with as many of his fellows as possible in the common pursuit of true judgment. The method of reading that he and others of his generation, like the critic I.A. Richards, developed was intended to cultivate in students an openness to, quote, complex and unfamiliar meanings and to avoid stock responses and attitudes already fully prepared in the reader's mind. It was important not only for the cultivation of students' intellectual capacities, but for the better functioning of society as a whole, which would benefit from its citizens honing the practice of standing back and dispassionately assessing, quote, views that seem to conflict with our own prepossessions in order better to investigate them instead of simply rejecting them. In embracing this function of criticism and in making judgments about which texts and authors had the intrinsic qualities conducive to promoting such reading and inquiry, the mid-century critics were appealing to an idea of liberal education that they had inherited from thinkers in the prior century. The great philosopher, philosopher of liberalism, John Stuart Mill, wrote in his landmark essay On Liberty, that liberty in a democratic society would depend on individuals learning the skills of discernment and judgment. As he wrote, quote, In the case of any person whose judgment is really deserving of confidence, how has it become so? Because he has kept his mind open to criticism and his opinions and conduct, because it has been his practice to listen to all that can be said against him, hearing what can be said about it by persons of every variety of opinion, and studying all modes in which it can be looked at by every character of mind, end quote. This essential value, doubting one's own certainties and being open to the possibility that others might have a better way, lies at the core of the liberal tradition. It undergirded a powerful sense of community that built the powerful sense of community that built U.S. society into the most stable and prosperous middle class the world had ever seen. And it also inspired the moral imagination that would give rise to and help legitimate the very multiculturalism that would come to challenge it. Mill's commitment to openness and tolerance was not just about improving oneself, becoming smarter or more insightful. He understood his position as a dialogue with opponents who, if they could be convinced to share that sort of honest self-assessment, would become interlocutors and partners in building a better community. In his critical essay on the romantic poet and cultural conservative Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Mill urged his fellow liberals to acquaint themselves with this powerful thinker and created a prayer to acquaint uh, a, a prayer that he wished his partisans would speak with him. Quote, Lord, enlighten thou our enemies, sharpen their wits, give acuteness to their perceptions and consecutiveness and clearness to their reasoning power. We are in danger from their folly, not from their wisdom. Their weakness is what fills, with us, fills us with apprehension, not their strength, end quote. While still radiating condescension, it is a prayer for dialogue, understanding, and community, not for victory. This passage from Mill is one of the first quotations in a book called The Liberal Imagination, the influential book of another mid-century critic, Lionel Trilling. Trilling begins with Mill because... He exemplifies for him not only the right critical stance, but the essence of the politics he believes criticism should embody. This liberalism is not so much a specific ideology or a set of policy recommendations. It is rather a philosophy about how democratic communities, that is, communities not of like-minded but of other-minded individuals, can, can survive and even thrive. As he writes, the job of criticism would seem to be then to recall liberalism to its first essential imagination of variousness and possibility, which implies the awareness of, com of complexity and difficulty, end quote. This conception of liberalism is wide and encompassing. It is generous, not exclusive. As Harvard professor of English Louis Manand describes Trilling's conception, it has a common core that makes room for much of the American political spectrum. Quoting Manand, in Trilling's view, the assumption that all liberals share, whether they're Soviet apologists, Hayekian free marketers, or subscribers to partisan review, is that people are perfectible. A liberal is someone who thinks that the right economic system, the right political reforms, and the right moral posture will do away with unfairness, snobbery, resentment, prejudice, tragic conflict, and neurosis. A liberal is a person who thinks there's a straight road to health and happiness, end quote. As Trilling goes on to argue and show, the job of criticism, and here we could add, the job of teaching the liberal arts is to help that hope by hindering it. 
by teaching us, in Manan's words, quote, that life is not so simple, end quote. This liberal idea at the heart of the mid-century approach to liberal arts education was not opposed by the new movements that came into their own after the 60s. On the contrary, it animated them. A university, Cardinal Newman wrote, not long after Mill published his essay, should promote, quote, the power of viewing many things at once as a whole, of referring them severally to their true place in the universal system, of understanding their respective value and determining their mutual dependence, end quote. Sure enough, these are the exact words Henry Louis Gates quotes in the face of the crisis he sees in today's America, which, which he goes on to call, quote, a world profoundly fissured by nationality, ethnicity, race, class, and gender. And the only way, this is Gates continuing, the only way to transcend those divisions, to forge for once a civic culture that respects both difference and commonalities, is through education that seeks to comprehend the diversity of human culture. Importantly, he goes on to add, any human being sufficiently curious and motivated can fully possess another culture, no matter how alien it may appear to be, end quote. As we embrace the new knowledge that multiculturalism brings us and extend the promise inherent in the Constitution of liberty for all, not just for some, it is vital that we heed that injunction. The divisiveness that has engulfed our society is predicated on incommunicability. Coastal elites can't possibly understand the, quote, forgotten man. Whites can't possibly grasp what it means to be black in America or honestly come to terms with white privilege. To try to an analogize from one group situation to another risks engulfing the one making the analogy in a stream of vindictive accusations of intolerance. And yet, the curiosity and motivation to understand others is the vital core of our democracy. And without it, we are lost. My mentor and teacher, Richard Rorty, believed that the movement that we can refer to with a shorthand, multiculturalism, and that he cobbled, cobbled together under the moniker the academic left, was responsible for a great deal of positive change in America. Shortly after the 2016 election, a passage from his 1990 book, Achieving Our Country, went viral on Twitter because it seemed to predict the rise of a candidate like Donald Trump. Here's the passage. At that point, something will crack. The non-suburban electorate will decide that the system has failed and start looking around for a strong man to vote for, someone willing to assure them that once he is elected, the smug bureaucrats, tricky lawyers, overpaid bond salesmen, and postmodern professors will no longer be calling the shots. One thing that is very likely to happen is that the gains made in the past 40 years by black and brown Americans and by homosexuals will be wiped out. Jocular contempt for women will come back into fashion. All the sadism which the academic left has tried to make unacceptable to its students will come flooding back. All the resentment which badly educated Americans feel about having their manners dictated to them by college graduates will find an outlet. End quote. I was a student of Rorty's at Stanford when he was working on this book and had the privilege of reading it in proofs before it was published. I recall feeling a vague presentiment of foreboding when I read it, but relegated it to the same compartment of likely true, but what are you going to do about it, in which I filed the assessments of most of the theorists I was reading at the time. When I read it in November 2016, in contrast, it hit me like a proverbial ton of bricks. Rorty's point in that book was that the academic left's divorce from issues of pragmatic economic policy in favor of advocating for cultural awareness and changes in behavior towards socially marginalized groups was going to have unintended consequences. He began by insisting on how much real good that attentiveness to language and feelings on college campuses, especially in the form of the creation of academic programs focused on ethnic, racial, and gender identity, had accomplished. I'm going to quote Rorty again. In addition to being centers of genuinely original scholarship, the new academic programs have done what they were semi-consciously designed to do. They have decreased the amount of sadism in our society. Especially among college graduates, the casual infliction of humiliation is much less socially acceptable than it was during the first two-thirds of the century. The tone in which educated men talk about women and educated whites talk about blacks is very different from what it was before the 60s. Life for homosexual Americans, beleaguered and dangerous as it still is, is better than before Stonewall. The adoption of attitudes that the right sneers at as politically correct has made America a far more civilized place than it was 30 years ago, end quote. 
The problem is not, as the right would have it, that colleges have become dens of intolerance ruled by liberal thought police legislating a conformist coddling of all things formally marginal. For Rorty, this accommodation and respect for difference was an unmitigated good for society. The problem, rather, was that the academic left made its powerful inroads in this fight just as economic inequality and and insecurity for the majority of Americans, regardless of race, gender, or sexual orientation, was taking a drastic turn for the worse. One shocking and sad fact about some of the numbers Rorty puts to his analysis in 1999 has barely changed in the almost two decades that have passed since then. As he wrote at the time, If husband and wife each work 2,000 hours a year for the current average wage of production non-supervisory workers, $750 an hour, they will make that much, $30,000. But $30,000 a year will not permit home ownership or buy decent daycare. Such a family trying to get by on this income will be constantly tormented by fears of wage rollbacks and downsizing and of the disastrous consequences of even a brief illness. End quote. In 2017, as of this writing, so this was last year when I was finishing this, the federal minimum wage is still $725, and the median household income is just above $50,000, even as the costs of daycare and, more spectacularly, higher education have risen dramatically since Rorty wrote those words. With the rise of multiculturalism in academia, has the community, was the baby of community thrown out with the bathwater of the mid-century consensus? In acknowledging difference and repression and exploitation, were we also closing the door on uncertainty and the desire to form new communities? The multiculturalism that swept onto college campuses in the 1960s had great promise, but in some ways and in some cases, it has lost its way. This is not because one side of the debate is incurably relativist and the other side of the debate is incurably racist and sexist. It's because both in society and in the educational setting that is that in its original mold was meant to combat balkanization, we have become so fragmented that we barely have occasions to disagree with one another, much less articulate those disagreements intelligently and risk changing our minds. As the critic Gerald Graff writes, the habit of preaching to the already converted is not restricted to the academy. A dangerous inability to talk to one another is the price we pay for a culture that makes it easy for us to avoid having to respect and deal with people who strongly disagree with us. This chapter, this is the last one I'll read from, is called The Great Equalizer. For people in my world, with book-lined offices overlooking the red bricks, white towers, and immaculate lawns of a private East Coast university, the morning of November 9th, 2016, was like the morning after the apocalypse. Having dragged myself to campus after a short and fitful night, I found myself looking across my desk at an ashen-faced colleague, suffering from a combination of politics-induced sleep deprivation and almost clinical despondency, as he recounted trying to teach his introduction to moral philosophy earlier that morning. How can I mention it? How can I not, he agonized, recalling the solitary young man in the front row with Trump emblazoned across his sweatshirt. A few hours later, I made my way down to the espresso bar in my building's main atrium. In this pleasant space, faculty and students can purchase lattes and panini and sit on an Italian marble patio hovering two stories below the spectacular glass ceiling built by German architectural firm as part of an $85 million renovation to Gilman Hall, Johns Hopkins University's fabled home in the humanities. The line to order the drinks was strangely subdued. The normal buzz of small talk stamped out by an oppressive silence. A hastily scribbled sign was taped to the cash register. Don't be an asshole. Listen to each other. Are people being assholes today, I asked Calvin, the appropriately hip and scruffy barista who passed his colleague the handmade Mexican coffee mug that relieves me of any need for me to ask for my daily cortado? Oh yeah, he replied curtly. Total assholes. Tensions ran high during the weeks and months after Donald Trump's surprising for the left electoral win. On some campuses, conservative students called out faculty, administration, and fellow students alike for treating their candidate's victory as if it were a cataclysm, even adopting the stereotypically progressive tactic of calling for safe spaces in which to hold and protect their minority views. Even on that first day, back in my fourth floor corner office with its alcove window looking out over Baltimore, the collective reaction I'd seen below started to gnaw at me. Here, 
in the literal pinnacle of the humanities, those disciplines dedicated to debating the core issues of human culture, ideas, and value, values, where professors like me are supposed to train students to support arguments with evidence and communicate their ideas with elegance and persuasion. Here, instead of debate, I was registering a kind of shocked and sullen unanimity. The problem is not simply that the great majority of faculty and students around me share my political ideology. Expecting half a building full of literary intellectuals to have voted for a man like Donald Trump would be as realistic as going to dinner with a large Italian family hoping to tuck in for some shepherd's pie in contemplative silence. The problem is far deeper. Where political debate used to be something one could take for granted in all sorts of forums, from backyard barbecues to workplace water coolers, today the opinions and positions one might have argued about in the past have morphed into something else. They've become attributes of our deepest selves, aspects that are not up for evaluation, but are treated as vital parts of a personal identity better to be cherished and protected than exposed. This shift has in part taken place on college campuses. Aaron Hanlon, now an assistant professor of English at Colby College in Maine, who was an outspoken campus conservative in his student days, recalls the moment this transformation occurred for him. Quote, I was a reasonably good-natured kid from a modest Catholic household when I showed up to my liberal arts campus. Then suddenly I was me, the individual. I was just white. It seemed that everyone was celebrating diversity and multiculturalism, and I didn't see a role for myself in that. It occurred to me, as it has to countless other conservative students, that I might also be a kind of minority, an ideological minority, because of my conservative political views." End quote. As he further explains, the left talked about women and students of color as victims of historical institutional inequality because of things like patriarchy, slavery, and Jim Crow. Most of us conservatives didn't suffer from similar, similar injustices, but we saw ourselves nonetheless as victims of ideological oppression. End quote. But if the purpose of Hanlon's reminiscence is to admonish conservative students today not to assume the mantle of victimhood, I draw another lesson. At some point in the recent past, as America was sorting itself demographically into a nationwide family feud, college, which should have been both an equalizer and a place for vital conversations to take place, stopped being both. While educational attainment level has long been known to correlate strongly with income and has, be has become among the most important drivers of inequality in the United States, it was only with the 2016 presidential, presidential election that a level of educational attainment became an equally potent indicator of po political persuasion. In some ways, it was even this shift that accounts for why the major media outlets were all surprised by the outcome of the election, since pollsters were not adequately weighting education when adjusting their raw data. As the New York Times' Nate Cohn writes, Quote, the tendency of better educated voters to respond to surveys in greater numbers has been true for a long time. What's new is the importance of education to presidential vote choice. Hillary Clinton led Trump by 25 points among college educated voters in pre-election national polls, up from President Obama's four point edge in 2012. Pollsters hadn't waited by education in the past because the effect wasn't statistically significant enough to do so. By 2016, it became so significant that it likely threw off their models and made them miss how popular Trump actually was. On a call and radio show in the spring of 2017, Michelle Goldberg, then a Slate columnist, now of the New York Times, got into an altercation with a caller named Scott from Tennessee, who berated her and fellow members of the coastal elite for a tone that, quote, dripped with condescension when talking about middle America. She responded angrily that she was repulsed by the sentiment the caller expressed, that the heartland was somehow more authentic than America's urban centers. The irony is that there was no obvious policy differences or arguments separating Scott and Goldberg. Rather, they were separated by their emotional commitments, by their rage. Goldberg's rage against real and persistent racism and sexism is entirely legitimate in a country where black men are imprisoned at six times the rates of whites, and where the same proportion of women are sexually assaulted while in college as currently serve in the U.S. legislature. Scott's rage is legitimate, too, in a country where the suffering of blue-collar workers from Michigan gets dismissed, or where the rural poor of Kentucky are summarily tossed into a basket of deplorables for expressing their anger. But that rage is also self-fulfilling because it cuts off the very conversations that could lead to a world in which all these identi identities were better able to achieve their goals. In other words, 
a white man working in a meat processing plant in middle America would benefit from supporting racial and gender equality. And a Latino woman cleaning houses in an East Coast city would benefit from policies supporting economic equality for all. But neither will make gains without understanding that the recognition they are demanding entails invoking a common story and recognizing how those interests overlap. In the words of Larry Laughlin, a small business owner from the outskirts of Minneapolis, politics today is, quote, like a hockey game. Everyone's got their goons. Their goons are pushing our guys around, and it's great to see our goons push back. Laughlin's vote, like his choice of fringe right-wing news sources, reflects an emotional attachment to an identity and the story underlying it. Laughlin put himself himself through community college after escaping from a broken family at 16 and went on to create a metal company with more than a dozen employees. Yet despite his humble upbringing, personal struggles, and even his decision to adopt three mixed-race children, Laughlin feels attacked and dismissed by liberals. Quote, You have a nice house and got it made because you're a white guy, he recounts being lectured by a friend of his children. There are all of these preconceived notions like, I'm a racist, idiot, a bigot, and oh, uneducated, end quote. Laughlin's experience, like the radio run-in between Goldberg and Scott, is, much of a, is part of a much larger story in America today. As we all know too well by now, Barack Obama's famous speech notwithstanding, there are indeed at least two Americas, a red and a blue America, a rural America and an urban America, a white America and a multi-hued America, And these two Americas are increasingly also a high school educated America and a college educated America. These two giant populations are continuing to draw apart geographically, economically, and politically. And as long as both sides fail to see that they share a common country, a common history, and a common future, our country will continue to flail about in political dysfunction with countless lives and resources going to waste. But what is crucial to grasp is that what we understand and rightly decry as divisiveness is really another word for inequality. And our education system, which was conceived of as a bulwark against inequality, has become a veritable machine for building and entrenching rigid class hierarchies. As the saying goes, state universities used to be state funded, then they were state supported, now they are located in a state. Today, all too many students are arriving at college from disadvantaged backgrounds, only to drop out years later, saddled with debt and worse off than when they began. One daughter of a working class family who made it into a moderately selective state university in the Midwest described the experience of being a student surrounded by people of means in this way. Coming from where I come from and not really being able to relate to some of the girls that were there really kind of made it hard. I'm from a small town, have to make uh, make do with what I have. I feel it came a lot easier for them than it did for me. It took a lot of studying and sacrifices for me to pull off my grades and do well, and I just wasn't the same as them. They could go and do whatever they wanted, and I was kind of limited on money, end quote. Because she had worked to support her parents all the way through high school and was now working to stay in college, she felt like she was in a different world from her roommate, who came from a family who could easily have afforded the $23,000 her school charge, her state school charge, for out-of-state tuition, not to mention the $12,000 for in-state tuition. As decisive as a college education is for success in today's economy, though, the problem doesn't start at college. The quality and availability of education from the earliest years has been repeatedly shown to have a significant impact on later earning power and quality of life. Throughout the 20th century, local school districts carried the lion's share of the responsibility for funding public education, with states and the federal government increasingly sharing those costs in the second half of the century. The percentage of the federal budget going to education peaked in 1949 due to the GI Bill, declined in the 196 until the 1960s, and then began to rise again. The period between the 1950s and 1970s saw increases in the percentage of local and state budgets going to public education, but these increases tapered off in the 1980s, only to rise again until the Great Recession of 2008, when funding for education was slashed by states to grow to plug growing budget holes. That said, the problem with public education in the United States has never really been just about overall spending, which at around $11,000 annually per child as of this writing, ranks fourth in the world. The problem has instead been that inequality is baked into our system and is only intensified as America has sorted itself into more and more socioeconomically distinct communities. 
1973, the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection did not extend to education, and that therefore unequal funding by school districts was not unconstitutional. Justice Lewis F. Powell, who authored the majority opinion, based the decision largely on the reasoning that education did not constitute a, fun, a fundamental right, and hence was not, the sub, was not subject to the protections provided by the 14th Amendment. In his words, quote, Though education is one of the most important services performed by the state, it is not within the limited category of rights recognized by this court as guaranteed in the Constitution. In a powerful dissent, Justice Thurgood Marshall wrote, I cannot accept such an emasculation of the Equal Protection Clause in the context of this case, end quote. Contrary to the court's reasoning in 1973, most, states, most state constitutions do include education as a fundamental right, and funding disparities have led to lawsuits in almost all 50 states. Nevertheless, if you were a student in New Trier, Illinois in 2009, you would enjoy the resources, teachers, and class size afforded by three times more money per student than was available to the Farmington Central Community District only a few miles away. It seems to me that the failure to recognize education as a fundamental right, along with our reliance on local property taxes as the basis for the funding of public education, is in many ways the policy root of our inability to maintain a baseline equality in our education system. And the situation is only getting worse. Since the financial crisis of 2008, state and local funding for schools has plummeted, in some cases by nearly 40%, and has shown no sign of returning to pre-recession levels. Because of its dependence on local tax bases, the biggest factor in public education inequality has been the geographic divergence in economic development in the United States since about 1980, leading to ever greater differences in local property values. For the four decades leading up to that year, the poorer sectors of the American economy were slowly catching up to the richest. But that all started to change with the rise of free market fundamentalism and the information economy of the Reagan and post-Reagan years. Since 1980, economic success has more and more has been more and more has more and more accrued to those with higher degrees living in urban centers, while the economic situation of those with only a secondary education or less and those living in rural areas has stagnated or declined. This regional disparity is mirrored by the higher education gap. Prior to 1980, the poverty rate among those with only a high school diploma was relatively low, around 7%. Today, only those with a college degree enjoy such low poverty rates, and the percentage of impoverished high school graduates has more than tripled to 22%. But while college graduates in general are more upwardly mobile than people who are not college graduates, there are also increasingly, increasingly degrees of inequality within the college-educated populace at large, including vast numbers of students who have borrowed excessively to join that world, only to drop out with no degree and encumbered in debt. Instead of leveling the playing field, education seems to be making it more uneven. It is this unevenness more than any other factor that is directly contributing to the patent failure of democratic dialogue in the United States today. While the thought leaders of the Republican Party are all, are all college educated, the base that they depend on is a mixture of white conservatives who felt alienated when they were at college and working class whites who never went to college and are now deeply suspicious of what they think of, of, what they think of or call the global, global and coastal elite. In fact, as a recent Pew Research Center poll showed, for the first time, a majority of Republicans and right-leaning independent voters now believes that universities, quote, have a negative effect on the way things are going in this country, end quote, a number that rose sharply in the year leading up to the 2016 election. To put it plainly, in the middle of a growing culture war, our education system created to cultivate a national civic culture is only making things worse. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions or entertain any dialogue, comments that you have. I'm only, I've been asked, as, as you have, to, uh, to have you walk up to the mic to, to ask your questions. Yeah, I, I thank you for your, your book and your topic. Um, but I want to ask a, a, a more simple question. You believe in education, and, uh, and I think you believe, and I want to ask this question, yeah. in early, edu first three years, a very important most psychologists would agree with that yeah. you yes very much so and um i wondered i could ask a question that i what percent of americans today are born out of wedlock mm -hmm. uh, if i if i understand your point correctly it's that 
uh, institutionalized education can only do so much because kids come from families and the families that they come from are predisposing them in an extraordinarily powerful ways to being capable or to a lesser or greater degree yeah. of receiving that education. Exactly. I, I would say that what I would acknowledge as being extremely important, and there's no question about this, is that um, uh, the, 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 in the educational environment at home, where one comes from before one enters a school is exceedingly important. Uh, Researchers have, have talked about a word gap uh, uh, that, that, that comes upon the millions of words heard by uh, uh, toddlers by the time they finally get to a place where they might be exposed to books and others in, in, in more institutional environments. This word, in other words, the gap itself between words heard by those in a deprived environment and those coming from a highly enriched environment can be in the millions of words heard. Every word a toddler hears, of course, is building part of a neural network of receptiv receptivity for, for future knowledge. So there's no question that the, that the environment that one comes from is, but I also believe, of course, that um, there's, there's no single factor that predetermines a, 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 a kind of factor, no single factor that predetermines a home environment to being as being highly, highly enriching versus highly, highly uh, uh, depriving. So I believe that there are two parent environments. Uh, while it may in general be better for a child to have two, two parents, I believe there are two parent environments that are highly deprived, uh, highly uh, violent, frightening, and, and intellectually deprived, and single parent environments that can be extraordinarily enriching. What way out of this do you see? And I didn't hear that. Of, yeah, so that's the third section of the, of the book is is the need to rebuild community, and um, so obviously I'm and writing. How does that happen? Uh, that's, there's a lot of policy recommendations in the third part of the book, so I don't want to list through all of them. But obviously, <laughs> I focus a good deal on uh, on education, what educators can do. But I also acknowledge that education is again part of that whole policy change, and that in highly impoverished uh, environments, it's going to be extremely hard for education to to really move that uh, move that needle. Yeah, so therefore, investments of all sorts of kinds are going to be required. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. No. So going back to your uh, chapter on liberal imagination uh, and you know that discussion of critical engagement, discussion and whatnot, so do you think a, a successful implementation of democracy or maybe even community entails commitments to certain philosophical positions such as... Such, such as objective truth or the rejection of others like standpoint epistemology? What I think it entails is not um, the acceptance or rejection of any particular philosophical doctrine, but I do believe it entails the conversations that allow those positions to be worked out and articulated, right? So for example, um, Someone like Richard Rorty, who I think was a strong, strong defender, and he's just one of a series of philosophers that I uh, that I quote in this book, a strong defender of every kind of everything that we would acknowledge and recognize as as essential to democratic institutions. Um, he didn't have much. Uh, uh, patience for interest in notions like, as he said, truth with a capital T or uh, objectivity in knowledge. He would say, look, the question of objectivity versus uh, uh, relativism, this is a philosophical game that philosophers get caught up in, right? If you're interested in public policy, you go out and you make policy uh, recommendations and you work to organize communities and you talk with unions and you do things like that. Um, uh, there are, are philosophical games that are played and that's good for philosophers and I've got nothing against them. But one way or the other, they're not going to greatly impact the kinds of, uh, of work that we're doing out on the street. What's important, however, is that those conversations be, be free and open and that, uh, that not one side or another side be simply precluded from or, or uh, ex sorry, excluded from or, or, or precluded from saying what they, what they want to say. So the, the, the potential clash of disparate opinions is the single most important thing. And if what we're teaching is an inability to have those conversations. That, I think, is a problem for democracy. Yeah, follow up. How, how do you, sorry, how, how do you think you're going to have those if there's no kind of truthful, truthful precondition to have the discussion? I mean, because I can have an opinion, you can have an opinion, we can disagree, there can be exchange and conflict there. But if there's no truth to undergird it all, I think what we what teach, are we talking yes, about? what we teach are, are, are standards of evidence. When you make an argument, and this I teach in any class that I teach, you make an argument, you uh, can't simply stop at an assertion. You have to find evidence to warrant that argument. And arguments without evidence uh, uh, are, aren't going to stand. Uh, so yes, we teach standards of, 
uh, of argumentation. I don't believe that these standards of argumentation are helped particularly or hindered one way or the other by grand philosophical notions of what truth is. And I, I so I guess I, I agree with Rorty there. Um, one can, can believe in some notion of objective truth as that which exists prior to or independent of my, uh, of my take on it. Um, as, as someone who's done a lot of intellectual history, my response to that is, sure, that is a, a, a relatively uh, stable definition of truth in the modern period, um, uh, but it has its history and it can change in cultures and times. That doesn't mean it's not valid. It just means that it's culturally contextual. contextualable. Right? It doesn't matter in a way whether you kind of agree that it can be or, 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 or can't be. Uh, what matters is that in any given cultural context, we can come up with at least a minimal amount of uh, or number of, of words and positions in common in order for us to disagree on those that we disagree on. And without that commonality, basically, you're just speaking other languages to each other. Right. Uh, thank you again for addressing this topic. Um, humanities versus what people go to college for now. People go to college and they major in computer coding and they major in right. uh, nursing. and they ma no Nothing wrong with all no. these things. Yeah. But it's not like if you go back... When Cardinal and Newman wrote the book about the idea of a university and uh, when we all took Latin or Greek and we had certain common Western Civ courses, mm -hmm. those are all gone. Mm -hmm. And in, in places like Europe where you have ministries of education, uh, all the people get a common core, at least in their schools. We have that kind of by the, the tyranny of the textbook publishers, mm -hmm. but we really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you grow up in a small town in, in eastern Kentucky, yeah. or you go to Scarsdale or New Trier or whatever, mm -hmm. you're going to get uh, a different high school. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you go off to college and... You're talking, I think, about humanities, liberal arts, yeah. but a lot of people don't do that in college. They go to college and they major in, in nursing or organic chemistry or, you know, they get away from all these value kind of things you're talking about. So I'm just kind of, it, my question is, as I read your book, I was halfway through it, is that, I mean, that that's the question. That's amazing asking, because it's not even released. It's officially no, no, I bought it tomorrow. tomorrow. I, I got I know, it early. Fast. <laughs> no, I was thumbing through it. And these are the questions I'm going to be asking myself. I go, but can you help us out now? Uh, because I think I'm going to go back to that as I'm reading your book. Uh, are you talking about liberal arts, yeah. about humanities? I very much. And, and what yeah. about the other people? And if we can't address it or we shouldn't address it or we don't have the resource to address it at the university level, should this be addressed at the secondary level? Yes, yes, and more yes. So absolutely the presuppositions of your question and everything that you're putting out, I'm 100% in agreement with. This is a, a book about the importance of the liberal arts and not just the liberal arts at college. The great, um, I would consider it to be the defining paradox of what I do on a daily basis is that I fundamentally believe that teaching the liberal arts and studying the liberal, liberal arts is necessary for a democratic society to function. And yet, I'm only teaching it to the the, the tiniest possible elite and that's the only poss that's the only audience that really feels that they are entitled uh, and that they can uh, sort of if you will afford the luxury of studying what should be in fact necessary for democracy to function that is the fundamental problem that this book is 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 dealing with so absolutely i believe first of all that precisely because our secondary system of education is so unequal and by and large doesn't provide a liberal arts education that college is for that reason, not just economically necessary, but is socially necessary, and it has become more and more so. Some form of college, and when I say some form of college, I really don't believe that it should just be about uh, turning oneself into a better economic uh, uh, cog in the machine, rather that this is necessary for uh, uh, an uh, optimally functioning democratic society. Mm. We know, um, and the, the great political scientist Danielle Allen has demonstrated this as well. There's been a lot of research that uh, civic participation does not only track with education level, it tracks with the kind of education that you get. And it's a very simple correlation. The more humanities and liberal arts courses you take, the more likely you are to be an effective uh, civic participant. Mm. Mm. Please. Thank you very much for coming and making this presentation. Um, as to the uh, balkanization that you've spoken about and the problems that that engenders on college campuses, 
Um, how do you convince all of these uh, groups that have been marginalized for so long and yeah. feel like they have finally now mm -hmm. gotten their voice heard? How do you convince them that they should now back away mm -hmm. from that uh, assertive position and look more at their role in fostering sort of the greater good? Because right. won't some of them say to you, hey, we finally got here. Who are you to tell us we should now drop back and talk about the greater good? Because for years, mm -hmm. you know, we were excluded. How, what do you say to people on college campuses on that issue? And I've been, thank you very much for an excellent question. I've been uh, practicing that um, that approach in the book itself, in a way. I'm trying to write a book that recognizes precisely the point that you're making. Look, these are hard-won positions. I understand that. Everyone needs to understand that. Recognize, first and foremost, the good that has been done. Recognize, first and foremost, that your participation as marginalized groups in this democratic conversation has only been enabled by us uh, uh, getting to this point. But nevertheless, if we want to go further, if you want to turn that into something that is ultimately going to have a, 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 a transformative effect on the society as a whole, it is time to broaden that uh, that conversation. And I point to, you know, certain political commentators have done a very good job at, at, at this. Uh, Van Jones, his most recent book, I mean, it's written at a very simple level for everyone, uh, you know, and he's, he's recognized on CNN as a, as a left of center commentator. And he said over and over again, you have to open the door to religion. You have to, you can't uh, 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 be um, uh, insulting towards, uh, towards Christians. You have to also listen to people who, uh, you have to listen to all sides. And this is someone speaking from the perspective of a traditionally marginalized uh, uh, racial group who says, look, I now have a voice. Now, it's, now I can also have the, um, the grace to listen as well. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Let's give Bill one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. <laughs>